Hello, everyone. Welcome and welcome back. I would say good afternoon, good evening, and early good morning. It really depends on where you are. We do have people dialing in from all around the world. I really appreciate your participation. This is our public lecture series on corporate governance number 14. Actually, this is a special talk on cocoa bonds. Cassidy, could you please share the slide? Thank you. All right, so this lecture series is hosted by the Institute for Corporate Governance at Kelly School of Business, Indiana University. I'm Jun Yang, I'm the director of this institute. It was founded in 2004 and we launched this series of public lectures in November, 2021 with a discussion on ICG, uh, ESG related issues. Um, and the mission is really to facilitate the discussions between scholars, policymakers, practitioners, and uh, to dis disseminate high quality research. So we want to thank our co-host, the ECGI, uh, European Corporate Governance Institute, Marco and Elaine, in particular, Marco, um, moderated the climate risk public lecture given by uh, Professor Laura Starks last time. I think I'm going to see Marco again on Drexel's Corporate Governance Conference. Thank you, Marco. And the IU's All Strongs Workshop has also co-hosted the entire series of public lectures. All right, for today's lecture, um, we've witnessed some some people use different terms. Some people call that banking stress. Some people call that banking crisis. I teach uh, online MBA, MBAs right now. So we have almost developed every single week talking about the new issues. And at one point, which is not long ago, uh, Credit Suisse and Coco Bonds came into our discussion. And then I realized, look, we tend to study corporate governance excluding banks. But right now, what's going on, starting with the banks, why don't we look into corporate governance of banks and the banking industry in general? And we have this expert who is right in my finance department. So that's why we added this special lecture on cocoa bonds. <clears throat> and Jane Yu is my colleague from finance department. Uh, Christoph is going to intro introduce uh, Jane Yu uh, with more details. Our next lecture is next week, a week from today. This is a regularly scheduled on corporate culture and future directions. The speaker is Professor Kelly from UBC. And the last lecture of the whole series is sustainability, a consumer's perspective. This is a marketing colleague from Arizona State University, Professor Niju Paharia. So I will uh, put this uh, advertisement right here. This is the QR code for next week's pop lecture. Take out your device, scan it. So that will lead you to the uh, link. We always share the recording, the slide deck, and our speakers answer to Q&As after the event, usually within a week, occasionally longer, because sometimes speakers are too busy to write up the answers to Q&As. So one disclaimer, I'm also running the finance department and we realized the CEO of Silicon Valley was our own graduate from the finance department and of Cali School of Business. And I joke with JU, our speaker, you teach uh, risk management. Uh, what we have done in terms of bank risk management, JU said that was 25 years ago. I didn't teach that particular person of risk management. Uh, in any case, uh, next slide. So our moderator is no stranger. Christoph uh, moderated the uh, blockchain crypto uh, asset uh, talk of Vivian Fang. Um, Professor Christoph Kleiner, Kleiner is my uh, finance colleague. He's associate professor. He started his career from uh, IU. He does research in corporate finance with focusing on banking, uh, bankruptcy, and he has been published in all top uh, finance journals, J Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, and Review of Financial Economics. Uh, most recently, he won the Brito Prize for a Distinguished Paper Award at the Journal of Finance. 
Uh, and uh, a couple of years before that, he won the Distinguished Referee Award from another top uh, three journals, Review of fin Financial Studies. He's teaching FinTech courses for both MBA, MSF, and undergraduate students. And he's teaching a doctoral class, finance, finance, innovation, labor, and household. He's sitting, uh, to my best knowledge at this point, of five dissertation committees for doctoral students uh, in the capacity as either the main advisor or co-advisor. And he's in hot demand. And he won the best mentor award from uh, Kelly doctor student as well. So one last piece, Christoph has done, I lost count, 10 or 12 interviews with media on the current financial crisis. I cannot find a better moderator for today's event. Uh, Christoph, it's yours. All right, thanks so much, Jim. So today's talk is motivated by the recent events, both in the US and Europe. So as of March 19th, the uh, UBS has agreed to purchase credit or credit suisse. And that was largely aided by the Swiss government to calm financial markets. Now, one aspect of that deal was especially noticeable. And that was that the Swiss government said $17 billion worth of credit suisse bonds would get marked down to zero, meaning their holders would get nothing in their investment. This is really surprising because bondholders generally have priority over equity holders. What we need to realize is these are not ordinary bonds. These are cocoa bonds. So convertible contingent securities, it's a risky form of debt that converts to equity when a um, predetermined trigger is met. Now, these triggers may be based on issuer's capital, they might be based on the balance sheet or regulatory concerns. Now, cocoa bonds, convertible contingent securities, are designed largely in the wake of the Great Recession. And they were issued precisely to give banks like Credit Suisse and others a financial cushion in the event of a severe crisis. Holders of the bonds, however, are still angry about winding up with nothing while the Credit Suisse shareholders actually received UBS shares. So luckily for us, IU actually has an expert in this area and can kind of help us understand these events for the past few weeks. So Zen Yu Wang is a professor of finance at IU. He's also our Edward E. Edwards professor at the Kelly School. He was formerly a vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he was head of financial intermediation. Previously before that, he was on the faculty at Columbia University and University of Texas, Austin. He's published research in a wide variety of areas, equity, fixed income, derivative securities, asset management, financial econometrics, and he's won a large number of awards, including the best paper award in investments at WFA. Beforehand, Pro Professor Wang obtained his PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota, where he was also the Sloan Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship. Now, especially important for today, during the recent financial crisis, he contributed directly to the design of a wide range of programs, the Fed Emergency Liquidities Facility, the reform of the federal discount window for collateral management, the bailout of Bear Stearns and AIG, the security design of TARP, and most importantly for us, the development of new capital requirements for banks. And so with that, I'm privileged to hand it over to Professor Wang. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christoph. And uh, I, uh, thank you, Jim, for giving me this platform to talk about this uh, confusing cocoa bonds. Um, so there are a lot to talk about it. And uh, let me uh, share my slides and uh, on the screen. Does that work? Everybody see my slides? Oh, no, not yet. Apparently, I didn't do it right. This is things. Yeah. OK. Uh, I didn't share a screen. I think I just displayed the slides on my own screen. <laughs> okay, now, yeah. Okay, uh, so, as Christoph said, and uh, there are a series of uh, banking crisis going on in both US and across the Atlantic. Uh, but then uh, in Europe, the most recent, uh, perhaps the biggest event is that a large, uh, international bank credit suites fall apart and uh, there's a, a bailout or you can call a bailout the takeover and a bank failure just like uh, uh, what happened to Bear Stern and a similar to that and uh, 
uh, in the 2008 financial crisis. So in this deal, and uh, there's uh, something that is different uh, from any other type of acquisition or merger or takeover, which is the cocoa bonds, okay? And uh, today's topic is to focus about this uh, cocoa bond. You can see my title there. And um, now let me directly dive in and uh, this deal to start my talk, okay? Uh, this deal was uh, announced on Sunday, last Sunday and on March 19th. And uh, then in this deal, UBS agreed to buy Credit Suisse. Okay, that's uh, everybody heard that. And uh, this deal is brokered by the Swiss government. It's just the trinity of the government uh, sort of forced UBS and to take over. And uh, yeah, uh, here this uh, three uh, I, uh, three regulatory or government identity uh, uh, entities are Swiss Department of Finance, the Swiss National Bank, and uh, the Swiss Banking Regulator called FIMA. Okay, um, then this deal is all share transaction, and uh, we all learned in the news that uh, this uh, deal goes like this: it's one UBS share. Uh, will be purchased exchange for uh, 22.48 uh, Credit Suisse shares. And uh, then this equivalent to about a 76, 0.76 francs and uh, for each of uh, Credit Suisse share. And uh, that's amounts about, uh, that's amount exactly of 3 billion francs total. That's the deal. And then in the news and various media show a picture just like, like this. And uh, basically it shows over how the, over the 12 years, the two, comp the two banks as uh, uh, market capitalization uh, depart, okay? Originally they are similar back in the 2010, then you come to the, um, the eve of the, the days of this takeover and uh, Credit Suisse, the value market cap is under 10, uh, 10, under 10 billion. So, and I immediately as a finance professional, we look at the deal. So the first question, why three billion? Okay. And where does the number come from? And there's no information about that. I'll, I don't really know how they come up number, but I'll give my thoughts later and about uh, what this number means. What, what does this number mean? Okay. So in this deal, and a major surprising part is that uh, the 81 cocoa bonds are white club, as the news reported. Okay, the credit streets hold, currently hold, in a 13 uh, of these bonds. Basically, these bonds are issued in various currencies, mainly Swiss francs and the US dollars and the Singapore dollars. And um, the power value of these total, I mean, they come out like uh, $17.3 billion. And then that's the uh, sort of a calculation by people reporting in the media. And, then when you look at this, it seems like it's a clear violation of absolute, absolute priority between debt and uh, equity. This is surprised the people. When we look at the, uh, the value of uh, equity, and uh, as I said earlier, the, the deal is a 3 billion francs. So that's amount to about $3.2 billion, but uh, the value of the COCO bonds in this deal is zero. So the, the bond received zero, the equity received a positive value. So how come we get this? FEMA's explanation is like this. It says the deal triggers complete write down of these securities. And why do they trigger it? They said the purpose is to increase the core capital. And um, what does it really mean? Uh, I will go into detail to talk about it and understand it. Okay, an immediate question from investors and reporting news varies uh, in all the places is that, is this really legal? Um, can you really do this? Are cocoa bonds debt or equity? So it's all confused, okay? This confusion can be seen in the price. 
If you look at the cocoa bond, uh, 81 cocoa bond uh, price, and uh, this is a one particular security in Credit Suisse, and uh, it looks like this, but it, at the beginning, well, uh, it's around the $100 and, uh, on the par, but uh, then it goes down and like a 40 cents or 50 cents uh, on a dollar. But it's still positive. And uh, when you look at this price, it looks like a, it's a been priced like a subordinate diet. And uh, when you look at the all kinds of pricing suggestion tools uh, floating around over the past 10 years, a lot of them suggest that this is similar to a uh, subordinate diet. So it's a debt. But uh, then when you come to this deal, immediately plunge it. And people learn about the wipe up, then they plunge to a few cents. And um, news reported that the dealers basically on the day after the deal and uh, uh, dealers uh, basically buying these bonds for about two cents on a dollar and uh, selling for about five cents a dollar. Then this also raises a question, how come these are still uh, worth a few cents, a positive price um, after the wipe up, if the wipe up should be zero. So what's going on, okay? And uh, then when, so the pricing seems, when you look at the price, it seems like investors are confused. And then you wonder, are these investors a sophisticated investor or not? It's hard to get information about the, the holding of this bond. So I collected these from a media report, various media reports over the past week. So, Apparently, they all reported that, that the Saudi National Bank uh, has a, is a probably the largest investor of uh, uh, Credit Suisse. They invest uh, in uh, 1.4 uh, billion francs uh, in Credit Suisse, and it just last year. And then the report said that they, after this deal over this month, and they lost uh, one billion dollars. And how much is the loss due to the wipe up of this uh, cocoa bond? It's unclear. I don't have the information. Then another large Saudi, I mean, sorry, investment is the, uh, uh, how to pronounce it, Kaita uh, Investment Authority. And uh, they just converted 4.5 billion of that to really 81, Credit Suisse 81 bond. But how much they are still holding, it's unclear. Okay, then the, there are many other hedge funds and uh, holding 81 cocoa pounds, and uh, probably the largest one is uh, Pimco, and uh, they hold around, uh, well, uh, this is a, uh, uh, the media reported that, uh, that is, they hold around uh, about $807 million 81 cocoa pounds from the Swiss. But this is according to anonymous person who not who is not authorized to to give the information out. But the Bloomberg calculated the investco and holds about a three hundred seventy million of these bonds, and I definitely will be able to wipe it up. And the BlackRock had one hundred thirty million in February, but it's unclear and how much they are still holding. Uh, as this even happened, another fund, the larger the capital, they actually allocated a 7.4% of their office. Of uh, so 1.45 billion euro of found on just 81, the uh, Credit Suisse 81 cocos. Oh, same as a large amount. And uh, another interesting piece of holders are the senior Credit Suisse employees. And uh, these are people are paid. These people are paid uh, as a composition. So they are paid uh, the eighty one cocos as a part of a composition. And uh, the bank's idea is that uh, well, uh, if bank hold these things, you should hold a similar portfolios, maybe um, so that uh, your incentive to be con consistent with uh, the. Uh, the bank apparently they're going to lose. Uh, they're not going to be happy. So you look at all these; uh, they are definitely sophisticated. But uh, then when you look at the cocoa bond pricing, they don't look like that. Okay. And then uh, so this is a sort of, uh, and uh, I don't know if it's uh, it's interesting or amusing. But if people, this reminds me of an old writing, and uh, which I saw uh, sort of. 
you know, 20, uh, 10 years ago, and a, a well-known writer right like this. So American comedian Will Rogers observed that uh, you can't say a civilization don't advance. In every war, we kill people in a new way. And then in each phase of markets, the investors find new old ways to lose money. This is written by and uh, Satya Jack Das, and uh, who is the author of Traders, Guns, and uh, Money. Uh, that's a famous book. Uh, he wrote this in Financial Time, I remember, uh, in 2012. And then uh, you can't help ask, so do they read prospectus of the securities that they invest? Now let's dive into it. And uh, when you look at the prospectus, and uh, it is a security redesigned to be both debt and equity, it's clear. And uh, typically by rule to qualify as 81, these cocoa bonds need to be perpetual, then you need two triggers. And one trigger is the tier one ratio trigger uh, using 7% uh, level as a trigger level. So when your tier one ratio drops to or below 7%, and uh, then you trigger the event, either I'll talk about it, either conversion or write down. Okay. In the prospectus, is well, quite a series of prospectors call it a consistency event. My understanding is that to check whether it's consistent with uh, uh, the regulatory capital requirement. The second trigger is called a regular, it's actually a regulator trigger. Uh, in the prospectus, a prospectus is called uh, a uh, viability event. And uh, basically the regulator can choose to pull the trigger. So what happened to trigger? So let's talk about a be what happened before trigger. Before the trigger, this is a security function as a debt. The bank raise funds at the par value, and then you pay interest regularly. And uh, this, this way you have no earning dilution and uh, your interest payment, uh, uh, mostly qualify for tax deduction, just like other bank. Then when you go to bankruptcy court and uh, this security actually has a higher priority, it's a senior than equity. So it, it's just like a debt, yeah? But, and uh, when it's a trigger, it's a different story. When it's triggered, it's a function like that. And uh, first you can stop paying interest rate uh, interest uh, without uh, any credit event. And a second, and, and then you convert to certain shares and that make it like equity, or you can just write down your power value, okay? But then credit suites use a 100% permanent, permanent write down, and they call it bail-in. And what it does, it just totally wipe out. And uh, that's a part of the contract then. And uh, this kind of design, uh, as far as I know, is uh, first proposed by two bankers. And uh, these are actually credit switch bankers, uh, uh, Paul Colello and uh, Wilson Irving. And uh, Paul was, um, and uh, I think uh, he was the head of the investment bank of Credit Suisse. And uh, Wilson uh, Irving was the chief risk officer of the Credit Suisse. Okay. And I think they started, uh, uh, as far as I know, they, they are the, uh, pushing and proposed and pushing for these kind of design uh, back in 2010. So this is the contract. You know? So essentially, this really want to blur the line between debt and equity. So you lose value, uh, so you can really lose value before equity, so if it is triggered. So you look at the design, yes, and now when you, equity is still 7% of risk-weighted asset, not zero, then you can wipe up this and you lose it before. Even if it's a write down and you can lose it before it. But if it's a converted share, you end up with the same priority, okay? Uh, but if it's not a trigger, and if it's directly sent to the bankruptcy court, and uh, then you actually have the absolute priority. And uh, it's a senior 
uh, is a senior claim than equity. So, uh, well, this explains why the price is not zero after being wiped out. Essentially, uh, these bond investors uh, try to bet that uh, the deal may fail and not uh, credit swoops may be sent to bankruptcy court. So, well, uh, how much that chance? And I don't know. And um, apparently, they pri price it have just a few cents on the dollar, very small chance. And uh, then people may argue, ask, uh, well, uh, if they in the contract, how can they? Uh, how can they go to bankruptcy court? Well, this is a complicated legal issue, which I don't have expertise. Sometimes your contract, as far as I know, sometimes your contract may be conflict with some other uh, existing laws and uh, people do challenge on it, okay? Then, so now who traded the cocoa bonds as debt? And uh, apparently, bond investors traded a price that has a subordinate debt. And then Credit Suisse also traded as a, a debt because they enjoy a cheaper funding as a debt. Okay. Now, who traded as equity? And, and then regulator do it. The regulator said it's additional tier one capital, it's equity. And uh, on the other hand, and uh, Credit Suisse said, oh, yeah, I use that equity too. I meet your capital requirement. When you look at this, uh, look at the, like a Credit Suisse everywhere. And uh, it seems like uh, uh, this uh, bank is doing, it's doing arbitrage between market and the uh, regulation. Okay. And uh, then this white power surprised the bondholders first, then the right of the sort of the straightens the entire global 81 market. And this is the price index of the 81 market, uh, a global 81 market. You can see the large drop at the end. Then they come back. And uh, why they come back, finally started realizing that um, other uh, 81 bonds don't have this 100% of permanent write down feature. And uh, people gradually realize that. And uh, well, uh, also, and on the next day after the white poppy and uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, other investment come out and say, well, uh, and uh, with this job 81 market is a buying opportunity because uh, many of the bonds don't have that. Let's uh, look at this uh, bond market. And uh, media says that this is a uh, $275 billion market. Okay. And uh, here, uh, I just listed a few large banks' uh, issuance of these bonds. And it uh, uh, seems like H HSBC has the largest uh, issuance, it's $19.7 billion. And then it comes to the Barclay and the UBS. So UBS has a lot of these things. And uh, then uh, the uh, BMP um, Proverbs and also uh, Society General and uh, then Santander and also Deutsche Bank. And uh, then, so do they have this write down or not? And uh, most, I would say, most of them are not, but the UBS and HSBC do many of the their 81 have these 100% uh, permanent write down clauses. So they are similar to the Credit Suisse. And uh, but most others use a partial write downs or conversion to shares. And then, um, but uh, for for triggers and all 81 cocoa bonds must have a regulatory trigger. This is the rule of Basel three. And uh, then, however, most of them also have tier one trigger. Except the, my understanding, except the Canada and Canada just use a regulatory trigger. Okay, if I get it, if I uh, get it right. So then, uh, wh which are the countries that issue most of them? The most, the, the well, I would say it this way: the countries with most the banks that issue eighty-one cocoa bonds. Uh, the most of these turn out to be China. The second is India, then go Britain, and uh, then Switzerland. And uh, the least of the one actually U.S. In fact, uh, none of the U.S. banks have issued any cocoa bonds. Then you wonder why. Okay, so what happened to U.S.? And so now here and uh, 
I would say U.S. did consider it. There is a huge debate about the cocoa bonds in the U.S. And uh, the leading proponents are sort of a Scrum Lake working group back in 2009, pick up the Mark Flannery's idea, really sort of educated. And uh, then Mark Flannery is the probably the earliest uh, a solo proponent of that. Then it comes with George Pinati, Calamuris, Harris, and there are other people. I just need a few here. Then the major banks also welcome and are pushing for cocoa. So one example is Goldman Sachs, and I think JP Morgan Chase also did. So I talked to one of the bankers, Goldman Sachs, why do you, why did Goldman Sachs want cocoa? And his answer is that, well, after the 2008 financial crisis, definitely uh, banks will see the capital requirement to go up. So you have to issue more equity. But if we can, uh, we can use the cocoa to re replace equity, that would be helpful. Uh, that's their response. And uh, then there are some scholars raising concerns. Uh, my course is right, sounds recent, and I wrote a paper and uh, then Admati and uh, several other people and uh, strongly opposed it. Uh, there are others too, I just need a few. And um, then in terms of regulations in the US, uh, first the US agreed the Basel III Accord. But the Basel III Accord in, uh, doesn't count COCO as a core tier one equity. The idea is that you cannot use COCO bonds to satisfy the basic Basel III requirement. But you can use it as an additional tier one equity to satisfy the additional requirement set by the regional regulator. That decision was left to the regional regulators. Then this gave the US and um, so leaves you as to decide that. And in Dodd-Frank section 115, it does require US regulator to study, to consider using cocoa in regulation. But then two years later, and uh, the, the US regulators, FSOC wrote a report to Congress after two years study. And, uh, but that study is required by this uh, uh, Dr. Frank, also the timeline and uh, is uh, two years after the Dr. Frank. So their decision is no cocoa as a regulatory capital in the US and uh, they want to leave it as a private sector uh, innovation. So this is the situation in the US. And uh, then there's another factor might play a role and that's the taxation. The US IRS, uh, the tax code and uh, section uh, 161L basically says that if you have a security, the bond, the reference or convert to equity, and um, then you're not qualified for tax deduction. So to US, if you US bank issue COVID, you will lose this benefit. Uh, which one plays a uh, bigger role? And um, I don't know. And uh, so this is, uh, is, uh, is uh, something that I'm wondering. And okay, that's the situation in US. That's why I end up, there's no cocoa issued by US banks. And then why the other banks issue cocoa? What's the really the main argument for cocoa bond? And recently I noticed that the, the uh, New Zealand Bloomberg keeps saying that the cocoa bonds is kind of security dreamed up by regulators. I don't think that's true. It's dreamed up by academics, it seems like. Uh, and uh, the proponent of cocoa bonds basically says, argue that uh, the cocoa bonds allow banks to obtain uh, to, uh, um, to uh, obtain bigger capital cushion without issuing equity. So that seems to be the argument. Then you replay, uh, sort of recapitalize the bank by private investors when it's triggered. So when you need a capital, it becomes a capital and then of uh, the trigger. So when you don't need it, you don't uh, need to have it. And uh, this, why we do this, this avoid the government uh, or taxpayer support. Okay. But if you, so, 
uh, Mark Flannery and uh, uh, Charlie Caleb Mirrors and Herring like this, uh, wrote like this, uh, said the academics and the uh, regulators conjectures that uh, including sufficient cocos in the bank capital structure could substantially insulate the taxpayers from uh, private investment losses. And uh, uh, Calamorous Herring also said that it will help solve our too big to, to fail problems. But when we look at this deal, in uh, this uh, event of uh, Credit Suisse. And uh, it doesn't look like that. The taxpayer are at risk again after 15 years, uh, 15 years after bailing out um, the UBS. And uh, because in this deal, the Swiss National Bank need to provide 100 billion francs liquidity line to UBS. So the taxpayer is on the hook. On the other hand, uh, the Swiss government uh, need to provide uh, Nine billion dollar, a uh, nine billion franc guarantee for the losses of uh, Credit Suisse asset acquired by UBS. So clearly, they are a taxpayer on the hook again, and that doesn't insulate at all. And when you look at uh, it, turned out last Friday, and uh, I think last Friday, and then the uh, there's a poll conducted in Switzerland. It shows that uh, two thirds of the people do not support this takeover. So this has become the question. This uh, main argument for COCO is in question. And uh, the other things that we notice, uh, the tier one ratio trigger, it seems useless. And uh, this, uh, just four days before this deal, uh, before uh, Credit Suisse will take over. And uh, Switzerland, the regulator, put out the announcement like this. Credit Suisse meets the higher capital and the liquidity requirements for systemically important banks. The chart I put on is their basic requirement. It's, uh, they, uh, this, I, I, I took it from their web page. And um, then the Credit Suisse balance sheet, if you look at it, at the end of the last, at the end of the last year, that's the total asset is uh, 531 billion uh, francs and uh, liability. Then you got uh, 486 equity. Uh, the total equity is uh, 45 billion. But there, then their a uh, core tier one leverage ratio is uh, 5.4 core tier one ratio. Or relative to the uh, to the risk weighted asset is a fourteen point one. If you look at the fourteen, compare fourteen point one to this is seven percent the trigger. This is a twice of that. Okay, so in this deal, how you you don't really have this trigger to be triggered. You cannot use this to wipe down. The write down is really triggered by regulator, not a tier one ratio. So you, then, is that good? It seems too late because uh, a few days later, the finance minister, uh, the Swiss finance minister, came out and said, uh, "Well, a sweet, uh, credit switch would not have survived Monday if we didn't do this deal on Sunday." So, and it uh, seems like uh, too late. Okay, then the tier one ratio doesn't do anything. So. We have a similar experience about the tier one ratio in the US. And uh, if you look at the buyer Stearns, the tier one ratio right before, it was uh, taken over by uh, GPFC, JP Morgan Chase. That's a 30.5% according to people's estimate. Now Lehman Brothers is 10.1 and in the months of a bankruptcy. And uh, then the, now the recent one, Silicon Valley Bank, that's a 15.4% in December 2022, all of them are way higher than the 7%. So the tier one ratio trigger seems useless. And uh, maybe for this reason, there are people like Flannery argue that we should use a market trigger because it's timely, objective, hard to manipulate. And then uh, there are some other concerns. And uh, my quote is right, Sanders and I, and uh, I wrote a paper, which is published several years later in 2015, said, uh, well, uh, 
if you use a market trigger, trigger you often have uh, multiple or no equilibrium prices. And when you have that, you lose the information about the bank value. And uh, then you get a large uh, pricing uncertainty and it open to uh, potential manipulation. And uh, this is all theory, but uh, then um, there's a group of economists uh, uh, conducting experiments and to confirm the thing indeed happens. Okay. So, and um, what is the current regulation about this trigger? And uh, so, Basel three clear says uh, tier one triggers or regular triggers or both. Okay. Never mentioned market trigger. But the European Union's uh, 2013 capital requirement regulation clearly says no market trigger. If you use a market trigger, your cocoa doesn't count as a, a regulatory capital. Okay. And then if you look at the practice, there is no cocoa bound use market trigger at all. Okay, so but this debate is still continuing. This is another topic I can talk for another hour, but I'm not going to go uh, talk more about this. I just leave it here. Okay, another question is that uh, well, does, what is the incentives of cocoa bonds in corporate management uh, or governance? And uh, people argue that uh, cocoa may help. Uh, to mitigate the risk shifting problems, okay, and uh, then the uh, but back in the, in my paper with uh, stress saturation, we said well, well, if you think of this way, if cocoa's par is a C and uh, conversion ratio is M, and uh, then the mean the convert to M shares, and uh, then uh, relative to uh, suppose you view the entire uh, entire uh, bank uh, share as a one share. And then uh, conversion price is a K. And then the conversion and uh, will replace the par value C by the MK. M, the number of share times the K. That's what the cocoa holder will get at the conversion. But then if you set M times K is lower than C, you subsidize the prior equity holders. Okay, you rip off the cocoa holders. But if, uh, or you do the other way, then you punish that. But then most follow-up paper says, well, then we should have set M K bigger than C so that you punish equity holder for running bank down. Okay, so, so that's a typically the way recognized design. But if you look at the, the uh, cocoa, this is a Credit Suisse cocoa bond structure, it's 100% right down. That's the equivalent to convert to zero shares. Okay, then clearly you, uh, so this right down will subsidize and it will subsidize uh, the, the equity hold, existing right to holders. And uh, uh, what, what's puzzling to me is that majority of cocos have a write down uh, clause. And it's a partial write down, but it's still subsidized equity. Okay. They design that way, totally contradict to the, the things that we do in theory. And um, so, doesn't this incentivize uh, the bank manager to run the bank down to trigger? So you can't help uh, answer that question. So there are several academic studies on the cocoa incentives and at least a few papers over there, but uh, clearly this should depend on design. But then also there's a problem in these papers and uh, I would say shortcomings and not problems because this paper assume that, uh, well, uh, when you put a cocoa, just existing bank liability structure, then you have cocoa, what happened? It doesn't seem a bank would strategically optimize their balance sheet. But if you do that, it's a different story. Here, I would like to mention, uh, to review this uh, um, sort of uh, uh, the risk things and interaction with uh, the bank responses. So in corporate finance, we all know, so equity is like option. So it's a convex function of asset 
uh, value, so higher risk and uh, higher value. And then Leland uh, and the Toft uh, and uh, the Prusik, they have paper so the, the governance can help, the bond governance can help remove such convexity, so in corporate finance. But in the banks, and the people recognize, yes, and uh, this restricting incentive is there too, but then bank capital requirement is just function like a debt covenant, right? So then you would hope this will help. So this is sort of, uh, Suresh and I analyze this in our paper, and uh, basically we, we find out that if you fix bank liability structure, okay, equity, indeed would be a convex function of asset value if capital requirement is low, even I is rather low. But when you raise it, indeed you can remove it, okay? But the problem is that that assumes that the, the bank doesn't respond to you raise of capital requirement. If a bank says, okay, you raise capital requirement, I readjust my liability structure, I need to optimize it and again maximize my bank value. But the one after you they did that, then the convexity stays there. So if bank optimum responds to you, and it seems it's hard to remove that. And this kind of uh, 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 responses and uh, defect responses have never been analyzed in the cocoa bonds. And uh, that's uh, something that uh, sort of, oh, we need more research. And then the other thing is that, uh, well, uh, people argue that uh, triggering cocoa can stabilize bank. Uh, some other may worry that uh, may be destabilized. And uh, for academic study on this, there is an interesting study by Valley and uh, which she try to see what a trigger event will do uh, to the bank's stability. But uh, there are not many triggers. So what he did is that uh, to use the uh, Europeans liability management exercise to infer it. What did they find in the paper inferred is that the trigger cocoa may help perform bank performance and uh, end up higher ROA and the triggering cocoa may send a positive signal and higher bank value and the bank then also this find the bank do not the infer bank do not uh, try to avoid trigger cocoa. But we see very different things in this credit Swiss event. And uh, when we learned that no more Saudi capital will help them, and uh, then they were taken over on a public assistance. And uh, in the Taylor World deal, and uh, it's given much lower bank value. I will talk about that. Okay. Now we also have some prior near trigger experience, and I especially by Deutsche Bank in 2016. And at that time, and you know, when they got close to trigger, and, uh, and then the CDS spread of Deutsche Bank uh, suddenly widened to uh, 248 basis point, stock price dropped by more than 40% in a couple of months. And um, then Deutsche Bank. Uh, try to avoid the conversion and offer to buy back a three billion dollar uh, US uh, uh, three billion euro of euro debt and a two billion dollar of a dollar debt. And then out of that at the CEO at the time is John Karen, uh, he complained. He, he said uh, they are not a great instrument and uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, really uh, need them going forward. Uh, same as after this, it, it, the, this the CEO doesn't like it anymore. Okay. And then the bottom question, the largest question, is, maybe most important question is, uh, does Coco really help financial stability? And uh, this uh, is the key part for uh, using Coco in regulation. Uh, and a uh, very influential, maybe widely cited research is uh, by Adjiv and uh, this, is not, this is a paper is floating around a long time. Uh, it's uh, several authors uh, on it and it's uh, uh, only appeared in print in 2020. So what it shows is that uh, the issuance of cocoa bonds reduces the CDS spread, okay? Well, 
And uh, if you think about that, Coco bonds the seniority to a senior bond. And uh, it, that's a sh what it should be, right? Because they issue lower tier bond and uh, then of course the senior bond and uh, you protect the senior bond. Then the other things that they find is that the issuance of right down cocos raise the stock price, but those conversion cocoa doesn't. But when you think about right down cocoa, oh, well, it subsidizes equity. Of course, it should raise the stock price, right? But the, uh, uh, so uh, before I go that there, so, and uh, the authors are careful enough uh, that uh, they don't say this is just mean they help financial stability. But uh, my struggle is that many other people when in the other papers always cite this paper's finding as evidence that a cocoa help financial stability. Okay. And uh, the relevant question was that uh, what if the an issue equity instead of a cocoa bond? Isn't that better or worse? And that question is not answered. But when we look at the 81 bonds and the credit suisse, and uh, I would understand how cocoa bond help financial stability this way. And uh, because um, the cocoa bonds actually help credit suisse to avoid being nationalized and avoid the, the massive liquidation of the bank. Uh, here are these a few numbers. Again, the total asset, the liability, equity. But the the 81 IPOP, YPOP, we see it's uh, 16 billion, take over price is 3 billion. But in this deal, what's not in the public announcement, which I took me time to find out through where the channel, now it's hard to find, is that they there is a bad will right down for asset. That's a 56 billion, that's not in the announcement. Okay, so the 56 billion, so it's a discount from asset value in this deal, basically a little uncertainty and uh, for this bank's asset. And this is a very typical for uh, distressed firms in takeover. And uh, there's a certain rule of accounting regulation for dealing with this. But uh, now then you wipe up 81, what you see is the va equity value will be the total asset value 531 minus the bad will 46, 56. Then minus the debt, but the debt is 486. Then you subtract the 16 billion of wipe up to reduce the debt obligation. You are left with 5 billion equity value. That's the, the accounting here, uh, uh, my guess. And that means at most the UBS would pay 5 billion. But uh, so, if you don't wipe up, what happened? If this is a regular bond, if you don't wipe up, you don't have this 16 billion take it out, your equity value would be negative 11 billion. Then you can't find the buyer. That means they have to go to either nationalize it or uh, liquidate it and uh, through bankruptcy court, and that would be really messy. Okay, so in this sense, this wipe up really helped by not being regular debt, by being an uh, cocoa debt. And uh, so, and uh, by the same, this helps, maybe helps financial uh, stability, but uh, all none of the academic papers are really shopping down this road, okay, in the cocoa bond. And uh, in fact, how much they can pay, they have to pay, but the regulation says that the, well, to have to, to make Credit Suisse a going concern, you have to have a, a tier one ratio to be 14.3%, okay? And not all have to, more majority have to be equity, common equity. But now the 81 already wipe out, but of course they have to use common equity. That means that they have to inject more equity. And now when you inject $3 billion, that brings the new Credit Suisse and a uh, uh, tier one ratio to be 15.3 above the 14.3, well above it. And the leverage ratio will be 5.86. And that's the rule of $3 billion. But if you reduce that originally on 
Saturday, the offer of UBS is one billion. If it is one billion, it's just barely above it. I calculated that a, the tier one ratio will be 14 point, uh, I think uh, 14 point five, and the leverage ratio will be about above. And uh, how low can you go? You can go down to half billion. So that's the lowest the uh, price, takeover price you can do. You have to put in half billion, otherwise the asset takeover will not satisfy the capital requirement. So the range must be the lowest will be point half billion, the highest five billion. Apparently, finally they did three billion. So that's what Charlotte gave sense about this valuation. So there are lower bound constraint that uh, you have to put in money so that it, it's, it's ongoing concern, but uh, that the maximum value is 5 billion. Well, oh, you can't help to argue. Well, oh, this is helpful. Seems like a Coco help this way. And that's my understanding why this helps. Well, oh, but you can't help wondering what if they had issued this 16 billion as equity in the first place? instead of cocoa. Would that be better off or worse off? I don't know. So that's the question that I have. Okay, finally, let me wrap up. Uh, I, so what I did is that basically reviews and at the bottom line is the cocoa bonds are both debt and equity. Some say maybe neither. Here I would like to quote the John Curran again. After the Deutsche Bank e event, then he come up and say, well, uh, this is kind of, uh, I like a convertible bond. But when you want them to be debt, they are equity. And when you want them to be equity, they are debt. That's how he feels. Okay. And uh, then for academics, and uh, the true color of credit is cocoa backs for a series of questions. First question is so why do banks issue cocoa? And earlier I said, uh, I feel like uh, Credit Suisse is doing regulatory upcharge. Is that true? Is that the real reason? I don't know. And uh, when you try to answer this question, you also need to answer how much. How much is optimal? And uh, that gets into the issue of optimal bank liability structure and uh, for the given regulation you put out there. And, and then whoever, I have seen many papers, uh, several papers try to explain a claim, uh, they explain why banker issue cocoa, but uh, no paper can ex really explain why US banks don't issue cocoa. I would argue, and because of when you are used to their argument, the same as like uh, the US should issue cocoa too. And uh, if based on their theory, but US didn't. So anyone who explain, explain bank, why bank issue cocoa, you have to explain why US bank don't issue cocoa. Otherwise, I don't believe the answer. And uh, the other big question definitely, can cocoa bonds really help financial stability? This is what we want, okay? To answer this, there are several sub questions that are already raised. And uh, one is that can cocoa be used to insulate taxpayers from bank risk. I'm not sure about that. And should, how should we design so that it does that? And also should the tier one ratio be replaced by something better? And or how to make a cocoa discourage bank risk uh, shifting? And uh, how to make a cocoa trigger, uh, cocoa trigger event uh, to s stabilize the bank rather than sort of cause chaos in the market we often seen. And uh, also how can Coco avoid uh, nationalization and liquidation in the bank? These are something that uh, uh, I haven't seen in the papers. And uh, that, well, at the end, as I just alluded, uh, and uh, in the accounting numbers, uh, how this Coco actually helped to avoid this credit Suisse bank to be uh, liquidated in a chaos. So, and uh, so a lot of questions here. I think there are a lot of research to do on this. And uh, so I think um, that's all I want to say. Okay, yeah. All right, well, thanks okay. so much. Yeah. Uh, this was incredibly helpful. Uh, I've learned a lot the last hour. I think we're very lucky to have you here today. We're also very lucky to have you at IU. So you can help us kind of understand these events. Uh, so for anyone in the audience, we have a Q&A 
uh, button, please you know, uh, submit your questions. We already have several, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next 15 minutes. So I want to start with some questions specifically about kind of the details of the Credit Suisse case. And so the first is from Mark Reeser. So he says, for the Credit Suisse AT1 bond, was it possible for it to convert to equity, or was only a write-down possible? It's uh, by the clause or by the, uh, the securities uh, uh, terms, it's only write down. There's you can't convert it, okay? And uh, that's the clause. And that, so it's, um, yeah, that's what it is the regular did. Okay. Yeah. And then on a related question, Jenny Bai asks, how, uh, how does this wipeout event affect the welfare of debt holders and shareholders? At credit uh, definitely, uh, it depends on which debt holder. If you have a local debt holder, if you count them as a debt holder, definitely uh, uh, that'll hurt them. And uh, because uh, people even say that uh, you remember the this uh, the uh, the uh, credit Suisse employees hold a lot of cocos because they got paid with the cocos. And uh, I think that this practice started from uh, uh, Barclay and uh, nearly ten years ago. And then the uh, I remember reading their proposal contract and, and uh, even see to. Uh, uh, once and uh, when he presented those things. Uh, but uh, in this event, it turned out that definitely those will wipe up. So people say, well, uh, so the Credit Suisse employees bail out their own banks. Okay, so that's uh, the original designs are there by those uh, Credit Suisse bankers that are bail in rather than the government bail out. But the problem is like well, when I mentioned this is that uh, uh, the private sector bailout is not enough, apparently. And uh, by the time you come to this point, you still put a taxpayer on the hook. Okay. So Rajiv Bhutani asks, for the investors to bear the risks of the wipeout, how, what was the spread on these cocoa bonds over comparable bonds, standard bonds? Uh, I don't know the spread. Uh, depending on when, uh, earlier, then I think the uh, the typically it's very often to see. I uh, remember in other years, look at the cocoa bond uh, yield. Uh, it tend to be on uh, uh, between seven to eight uh, to seven to nine percent. So it's a pretty much look like a uh, support in the best. Okay. Then the of course, and after the white pub, and then uh, even near the white pub, these are drop to and uh, below fifty cents per dollar. So you can imagine how high the yield is. And uh, then at the end, it's a few cents of a dollar. And um, yeah, so it's uh, and uh, when you uh, not much point to compare the two yield anymore. Yeah. Uh, so Jamie Vic Andrews asks. So suppose one confines cocos to regulatory triggers based on a resolution or merger and allows only write downs, not conversions to equity. Do you think this qualifies as tax deductible under IRS rules? Uh, that's a very good question, but uh, I don't really know. And uh, this is, uh, you need some tax uh, expertise uh, for that, and uh, I'm not. And uh, yeah, the earlier the U.S. really get in trouble with the conversion because originally we all think about conversion. Uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, yeah, if if you rely on tier one ratio trigger, you may still get a problem because you reference uh, uh, equity value. Uh, so you have to remove that. Only use a regulatory trigger, then you avoid the through. Okay. Okay. And as another question on the regulation, so Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Godek asks, do you think the lower technical trigger level is meant to give regulators more flexibility? And what are the benefits of the structure? Uh, in fact, that the seven percent trigger was called a high trigger. It's high trigger cocoa. And <laughs> they don't think it's low. Okay. And uh, 7%, uh, that's uh, the basic possible require capital requirement for all banks. So then the question is that, uh, should we make it even higher? I don't know. You can see that uh, at the bankruptcy, their are, tier are one ratio is 14%. Do you want 14%? And uh, so it's uh, uh, same as like a tier one ratio, how high is that? Uh, it, it doesn't solve the problem. Okay. Uh, essentially, the regulator trigger need to kick in earlier. 
uh, in my view. But that never happened, given the politics there. And uh, you, you see that this one is quite late. Okay, uh, back in uh, in the paper story, South I wrote, we wrote down, speculate the regulatory trigger will not be early enough. And then you, then they defy the whole purpose of COCO. The early argument of COCO is that you get the capital, convert to capital timely. But when regulator convert, they pull the trigger very late. And until things are really bad, they pull the trigger, then it can never be timely. So that's the issue there. And then I already talked about the tier one can never be timely. Okay. So, and then a related uh, regulatory question. So are the taxpayer risks in the takeover really due to the fact that the AT1 was written down while there was still value in equity? Would the deal have occurred without taxpayer risk if Credit Suisse had issued equity rather than AT1 bonds? This is a question by, from Paul Davies. Oh, okay. I think the, uh, the government support is uh, basically to, uh, to sort of uh, hedge the the UBS risk, takeover risk, because uh, uh, because there's nine billion franc guarantee for the potential loss of credit asset, and uh, basically, and uh, so you be from UBS point of view, it looks like this. I okay, I, I'll I'll take this company. I look at the value, but there's huge risk there, and uh, then I'm willing to take the value, but uh, I cannot swallow too much risk. So this guarantee help to hedge the downside. And then also because of this, I may end up need more liquidity. So the credit line is very important. So basically government support so that UBS don't go down. Otherwise, and then this risk kind of bring both back down. That would be terrible. So you basically, you got someone saving someone uh, from the river, but then both get drunk. Yeah, you could end up with this. But this type of same thing, that, uh, I remember, uh, uh, so I was personally involved in the, the bailout of Bear Stern. We call it bailout. It's not really bailout. It's the JP Morgan Chase taken over. Over there, we also provide $30 billion loan to JP Morgan Chase. So the public is on the line always. And it seems uh, without this, the these bank won't take the deal. Yeah. So, and this is uh, again another regulation question, uh, also from Mark Reeser. So, other than mark market equity prices, what other factors would regulators consider when deciding whether to trigger a cocoa? Uh, I think a regulator only, as far as I know, consider these accounting trigger, consider the regulator trigger. Consider the market trigger, and uh, that was a debate long, for a long time. And uh, in fact, uh, back to 2010, 2011, US regulator, and uh, based on my knowledge, they didn't like regulatory trigger. They didn't like uh, uh, the accounting trigger. They knew that it would be late. It doesn't work. And uh, when I remember when the earlier proponent sort of people argue for COCO and uh, they one of the main argument is that uh, when we uh, for a uh, market trigger, if we use a market trigger so we can we don't have to leave the decision to regulator okay then we will avoid accounting manipulation because uh, and it's well known that uh Lehman Brothers use a uh, uh, repo 105 to manipulate their books before they, they fall apart and uh, so, and uh, there are a lot of good argument about the market trigger, but uh, technically it becomes a problem because uh, the market price depends on when you convert or not convert. To keep the consistency becomes an issue. And uh, that's the things that uh, Sir Sanders and I pointed out. And uh, once we point out this problem from a fundamental finance level, you cannot put a rational price on it. And uh, then the US regular say, okay, the market trigger doesn't work. So seems like I don't like it. And uh, they did, so my sense is that they didn't like accounting trigger. They didn't like uh, the regulatory trigger. 
Then at the one time they think the market trigger sounds sounds good, but it turned out once that one is not implementable, and uh, and then U.S. regular regulator seems to stay away from it. And the main thing that looks like a very complicated, yeah. Okay, I I have a couple questions specifically about the U.S. So as you mentioned, cocoa bonds uh, are not currently in the U.S. So William A. asks. If cocoa bonds were issued in the U.S., what is the risk that taxpayers would be on the hook to bail out substantial holders? We've seen the FDIC arbitrarily go beyond the state limit with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. What would stop the government from bailing out cocoa holders? Uh, yes, but this, uh, yeah, basically what you see is that, uh, uh, I think that, that I mean, uh, this is a lot of question. And uh, the bottom line seems like you're asking whether and a cocoa bond, if cocoa bond issue in the U.S. could help U.S. government uh, avoid a bailout like Silicon Valley uh, um, uh, Bank. Uh, based on the experience that we had, it seems like uh, it doesn't avoid that, okay? So you s the whole point of these, like uh, in the Credit Suisse case, Credit Suisse has a large, I forgot the number, I'll, a large amount of also the deposit there, okay? And uh, it, what you really, regulator really want to protect is the depositors to deposit. And uh, so it's, uh, and now I, I, I'm not sure a COCO can solve this problem. And uh, maybe you're thinking that uh, whether COCO can help uh, this uh, sort of uh, um, reduce the burden on the, Deposit insurance. Right now, we're debating whether it's be long limited, how high is there to be, and now that issue came up. And now definitely, is unlimited deposit insurance will be a huge burden of uh, public and uh, of taxpayers. But the, you think, uh, well, uh, if bank issue cocoa, then maybe we don't need that much. And uh, there's another issue that uh, the cocoa typically issued by large banks. And uh, for a mid-sized small bank to get into this market in the same, so like, uh, um, uh, so far we don't see it okay. because it's complicated security. Yeah. And then I'd like to just conclude with two questions from our colleague, uh, Chuck Chizinka. So first, does the failure of Coco tell us something about corporate governance of the specific bank? And more generally, are, are U.S. banks better governed? Uh, that... Uh, I think U.S. So whether U.S. government maybe the questions understood this way, maybe you're thinking, uh, U.S. banks didn't issue cocoa because they are better governed, and uh, but I think this is because regulation doesn't come. Because uh, my understanding, uh, several U.S. banks uh, really want cocoa. They argue at a Basel. And now uh, they think uh, there's, I remember you many years ago, Bloomberg has a report saying that uh, the Basel decision is a slap on the face for U.S. Wall Street banks. So if you count as a regulatory capital and uh, they're going to issue it. And uh, that's my, my view. They really want it. And uh, the main reason seems like, I'm not sure how much is about tax. I really think is whether regulation counted or not. Essentially, the, so that make me suspect you know, whether this really just gave them a, a regulatory upcharge that I talk about. Okay. And then finally, <laughs> after the Credit Suisse experience, is there any future for cocoa bonds? Oh, uh, many people really, I actually sent the email and uh, uh, say that uh, is this is the end of cocoa bond. <laughs> uh, it's hard to predict. And uh, so definitely this is going to uh, be a, uh, make, uh, uh, make it hard for U.S. regulator to count as cocoa, yeah, given this event. And uh, for futures of cocoa, and that depends on whether the regulator wants to change, how they view it. But uh, definitely some regulator could argue cocoa helps, like uh, the last, the, toward the end, I argue. And uh, it, the, the cocoa, did play a positive role in avoiding nationalization, in avoiding um, the, this uh, massive liquidation. Okay, so the, so I would say uh, 
there's definitely going to die. Uh, but an investor will price them in better in the future. Okay, they will realize that uh, this is not just a subordinate debt. Okay, then that will definitely make a uh, issue cocoa more expensive, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks so much. This okay. was incredibly Thank helpful you. as I knew. Yeah. Uh, we all appreciate it. June, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. It's a fascinating lecture. I've learned a lot. I know you are a award winning teacher from my experience, but this is really informative. <laughs> And maybe we can do a little bit more uh, bank governance or even the Federal Reserve Systems governance in the future. Coming up, um, we have next week, uh, next Thursday's Corporate Culture and Future Directions by Professor Kelly from UBC. Uh, my colleague Ankit uh, Kelda will be the moderator. And the last lecture for this year is going to be sustainability, a consumer perspective. So thank you for attending the last slide. I have the QR code for the coming lecture next week. Um, so all of our lectures will be recorded. You will receive an email on the recording with the slide deck. And there are many questions, 18 questions in total, some of which Jane didn't have time to answer. So Jane would write up his answers to all questions, including the ones he didn't have a time to answer. That way you could have a more comprehensive understanding of the cocoa bond issues and maybe related issues on bank stability and perhaps the future path for the banking system. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you next week. Bye. <laughs>